Before we begin, can you make sure that your cell phones are on silent and are off? Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Donnelly College and the Sister Jerome Lecture Series Common Read Author Event. I am Lisa Studoff, Dean of the College, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Donnelly College's seventh president, Monsignor Stuart Swetland, who will open us in prayer. Monsignor. Good morning, everyone. There's an adage in Catholic theology and Christian theology writ large, lex orande, lex corende. The law of prayer is the law of belief. In other words, the prayers that the church have prepared for us in our various liturgical celebrations reflect what we believe. And the Catholic Church has particular prayers in a mass for special needs, for refugees and exiles, for those in need, and prayers for peace. So this prayer I'm offering today reflects those prayers from those uh, liturgical celebrations. Let us pray. The Lord said, I, I think thoughts of peace and not of affliction. You will call upon me and I will answer you and I will lead you. I will lead back your captives from every place. Oh God, author and lover of peace, to know you is to live. To serve you is to reign. Defend against every attack those who cry to you so that we who trust in your protection may not fear the weapons of any foe. O oh Lord, to whom no one is a stranger and from whose help no one is ever distant, look with compassion on refugees and exiles, on segregated persons and on lost children. Restore them, we pray, to a homeland and to a family and give us a kind heart for the needy and for the stranger. We ask this all through Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Monsignor. Donnelly students, staff, faculty, distinguished board members, Jerome Society members, our neighbors from Bishop Ford High School, and guests both in attendance and those live streaming us today, I want to welcome you to today's presentation. I would like to thank Aaron Williams, Rachel Corkill, and all those on the Donnelly Common Read Committee who made today's event possible. A special thank you to Nelson Newcomer for his assistance in securing Immaculate's visit to our campus. Each year, our community chooses a common read, which reflects our mission, vision, and values to discuss as a community of learners. Left to Tell is Immaculate Ilabagiza's memoir about her ordeal surviving the Rwandan genocide. The 1994 genocide claimed 1 million lives in 100 days. Immaculate details her life during this time in a connection to God, praying for forgiveness of the killers. Immaculate has recently been honored by the president of Rwanda with a presidential unity award based on values such as patriotism, integrity, truth, humility, tolerance, impartiality, fairness, and one who fights against genocide ideology. Please join me in watching this brief introduction of Immaculate's story. I was born in Rwanda. So Rwanda is a tiny country located in the Central Africa. It was and still is one of the most beautiful places in the world. 
very great and perfect tropical weather. My village was in Kibuye. Our house was on a hill that overlooked Lake Kivu. My mom and dad were teachers. They were very good parents who were very respected in the village. In my family, we were four children. I was one girl among three boys. We loved each other a lot. We were very protective until the last time we separated. There was a rebellion going on, an ethnically based rebellion uh, in Rwanda. Right after the holiday, I had an exam, really an important exam. The regime in Rwanda that was responsible for the genocide was a criminal regime. It operated uh, according to the logic of criminal gangs. So I wrote to my parents and I told them I wanted to stay in school to prepare for my exam. And the aim of the, uh, of the uh, military dictatorship was to preserve power by eliminating that rebellion. My father said, we miss you and you have been away so much, away from us. So I went home. Easter vacation that year changed everything in my life. The president is plain was shut down and the genocide began. The two leaders died after attending peace talks aimed at ending decades of tribal conflict in the two countries. President Habyarimana of Rwanda and President Ntari Amira of Burundi were killed when their plane came down near the Rwandan capital Kigali. Both were members of the majority Hutu tribe. When the president's plane was shot down, it just was was chaos. Within less than an hour, you started to hear the gunfire in your own neighborhood, right up close to you. Before, it was always kind of far away, and it's like it just spread everywhere. It was a very well-organized program of genocide. Uh, it had been established before the plane went down, and it was just waiting for this event, or an event like it, to click into motion. These people had lists. They had lists of people that had to be killed, they had, and then it became crazy. And I remember my father telling me, we are worried that you might get raped, and we, we are worried that we can't help you. They were going home to home, neighborhood to neighborhood, uh, breaking down doors, hacking people to death. Some of the names of uh, Tutsis were being broadcast on the radio. When I saw Immaculate back in, in her own home area, and she says to the photographer, come and take a picture of me with this man. And, and I'm asking her, who's this man? And she explains to me, well, his brother killed my brother. And I'm like, wait, you know, my Western mind is kicking in and I got to understand who, what, the details and stuff. And she just puts her arm around him and she says, no, it's okay, it's okay. I just about lost it. Because it's not okay. You read in the powerful little museum here in Kigali, a young Rwandan child saying, if you would have really known me for who I was, you could have never killed me. think about heroes here in Rwanda, I think about people like Immaculate who are 
willing now to share what life is like. Going back, touching on it, exploring it. For her to take the time and to visit these places with people like us and let us share in some of that grief and some of that process takes unimaginable courage. I did hate, of course. I was very angry. During the bathroom time, I couldn't understand how another human being can cause you so much pain. Why? We were all created. We never chose to be. We become. We don't choose our race. We don't choose our tribe. We don't even choose the country where we are born. And I thought that I can pay them back for what they were doing to me. And thank God I was able to see that that was useless. That was only going to prolong the pain and hatred in this world. I hid in this tiny bathroom for 91 days and they never found me. But I found myself. Welcoming the author of Left to Tell, Immaculate Illibiza. Hello, good morning. Good morning. It's really a great joy to be here. That was it. No, you can hear me. Yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> It is really a great joy to be here. I'm loving to be in your city, in your school. It is really surprising. I knew this school was actually, as they told me, it's very diverse, but it is surprising to see how diverse you are. It is really good. <laughs> how my kids would have loved to be in a place like this when you know you you everyone find home and find them welcome. So it is really a joy to be here. And I'm so grateful to Monseigneur for inviting me and for giving me a chance to share my story with you. I always say everyone has a story to share. And of course we all do, but I guess today is my turn. is who you choose to be able to share. So the genocide as you saw in the documentary was a terrible experience, but just like life, and especially through suffering, we learn so much about life. That is an experience that taught me so much. One of the, the lesson it taught me was the power of love. I mean, I remember during the genocide asking myself, what went wrong? How can this be? How can this mess be? And I felt like in my heart, our Lord was making it clear. Love went wrong. You didn't love as I told you to love one another. So then, so what should I do then? Why me? What? Well, you can't change anyone. You can only decide as an individual to be that loving person. And it is a hard truth to know because we wish to blame somebody else. We wish to feel like somebody's not making it work. But I realize that it starts here with me. So a big lesson to love. I truly feel that every day I wake up, my job is to be the most loving person as I can be. And I fell. Thank God, I'm Catholic. I go to confession a lot. <laughs> You know, no matter how much I try to, to, do be, to do good, I always find myself falling, you know, not robbing the way I should have done, not doing what is robbing the way I should have done. But love is really a God for me every day. And then I realize this is what our Lord has told us. Love one another. So if you see in the world where there is wars going on, at the basis of all, there is always a lack of love. When you start to see another person like they don't matter, or selfishness, which is hatred again, no love. Or feeling like I'm better than you, which is again, no love. So love is so important. It was a huge lesson for me. 
Another big lesson I learned was the power of forgiveness. Actually, not even just the power, understanding forgiveness and how important it is, and also understanding it is possible. Because I used to think, I mean, I was in a college when the job site started. I used to think, you forgive somebody who says something bad about you or who take a book away, doesn't return it. I would think about, you know, forgiving you. Now I am somewhere, actually, they're killing my parents and trying to kill me. And I thought, no, you don't forgive this. This is unforgivable. But the more I was angry, the more I had pain, the more I had a headache. I mean, I still remember sweating out of anger. My heart would be racing out of anger. My whole body was aching out of anger. And I remember thinking, no, what is touching me? And yet, look how I'm feeling. I wish to forgive just to be innocent again. How do you be when this is happening to you? So when I came to learn about the anger, it was such a relief. And I was so grateful how God helped me to understand it working with me through it so that I was able to let it go. And I'm really here to tell you forgiveness is possible and it is such a freedom. You can't say I'm free if you're always waiting for someone who will go to you for you to become angry at them. Because the more you're angry, the more you are a real prisoner. And there's that pain. And it doesn't depend on you. It depends on other people's actions. So I felt like, ah, oh, I am free now. I can just know, and if you do wrong, that's your problem. I have to be wise to know how to protect myself, but I can forgive you. You don't have to hold me with you to work with you because when we're angry, sometimes we think about people we're angry with more than the people we love. How fair that is, how unfair that can be. And people who do us wrong, we forget them quickly, but we want to think and you know, constantly about people who do us wrong. But that was a huge lesson. Another big lesson I learned, another big lesson I learned was to understand, actually I would say a gift, to understand without a shadow of doubt that God is real. And truly, what a treasure we have to be Christians. What a treasure we have actually to know God. You know, I mean, we might be different religion, but we all have a basis if you belong to any good religion, there's God, to believe in him. Because we know with God, all things are possible. But without God, as a human being, we are limited. I have a prayer group. Somebody last week told us, he said, she said, you know, pride is really can be a good thing if it was real. Because it's not real. It's a lie. As who work and you air can, you air can just come out just like that. That is so simple. So our pride is really nothing. You can fall anytime. And every day we have people who die. And who die without planning it. So that shows you how simple, how little we are, and how humble we should be. So the genocide started in 1994, coming back to my story. And I've been so privileged to go around the world sharing my story. Especially, I love to hear when people tell me, or I know it is happening when it happens that somebody is able to forgive somebody else. Because now they can see what now they can see what I felt. They can feel what I felt. I remember one lady told me she was angry with her mom for 20 years. She said for 20 years something happened. She snapped the door and she never looked back. She said, after I heard you speak, I went home, I called my mom. We cried and laughed. It was over just like that. And she came back to see me in another talk I had. She said, I just had to share with you what it was. And she said, I can't believe how much affection I wasted from my own mother, the out of anger. And it was just all in one day. I can't believe how much affection I prevented my children from having from their own grandmother out of anger. And that is really a prayer I have anytime I speak praying to God that he will touch people as he touched me. He touched me. Because you can speak as you know, and some people might really care like, oh, I need to do this and I need to do that. Other people might not. Or people will be touched in many different ways. But whatever it is, I pray to God that that will be something that God will touch your heart. I went to school one time to him. And um, after I left, it was high school. And uh, this boy wrote me a letter. And he said, uh, before you came to the school, I was really mad. I was planning something bad. He said, my heart was broken because my girlfriend left me to be with my best friend. 
<laughs> he, was trying, he was mad. I was just so mad. And then he said, how they came to speak to us. I went to see them and I said, guys, have fun. I forgive you. <laughs> I was just free. And then he told him, he said, and then two weeks later, the most beautiful woman walked into my life. <laughs> and now I am the happiest boy in the whole world. <laughs> So he said, if only I have not forgiven, I would still be in that misery. I could have done something terrible that could have had consequences in my life. So again, we all go through suffering. It's a part of life. I just my prayer, and I pray really daily, just please dear God, help people to see. I can never fight with anyone who is not forgiving. I can never look them down because I know what it is when you are in that war, you are stuck there. It's like there's no way out. You think I think there's no way out. Anyway, coming back to my story, the, the genocide happened. I was a student in college, like you, and I went home for Easter holiday. I still remember I had an exam after the holiday. I guess I thought that was going to happen. And I wrote to my parents, I said, because we didn't have phones, so we have to only to write. I wrote to my parents, you know, I think I'm going to stay this week in the school because I can use the library and then I can stay here and do the exam well. I know you wanted me to study well. And my father wrote to me with my mom and he said, you belong to us and the school, we lend you to the school to study, but the school can't have you all the time. Like you have to come back home. Even if it's a week, we we'll give you a place to study, but you have to come home. I'm not kidding. I left home, home for home, out of obedience to my parents. Two weeks after, the whole 900 people who stayed, they were all killed in the school. Not to say again, oh, they were bad in oh, I am lucky. I consider myself lucky to this day. Not because again, people who died, they, they have anything wrong, but because thank God for what I know. Thank God that I can work for my heaven. I always feel like maybe they were better off and then God wanted to take them to heaven. But for me, I still have work to do. I'm so grateful for the work I do, for what I know, for the people I meet, so that I can work for my heaven also, because we all don't know when we will go. But I am here again because out of obedience to my parents, I went home and that's why I'm here today. And I said to my life in that way. So anyway, I went home on the third day after I was home, the genocide started. Still remember it was in the morning, my brother who had just finished his master's degree, he came to my room and opened the door. And he, I remember he had on a jacket, a stick in his hand, and I knew something had happened when I look, looked at him. My worry was, oh, what happened? Is my dad sick? Is my mom sick? Is somebody died? Please God, if what he can talk quickly, he told me, the president of the country was killed last night. I jumped out of the bed. It was like I can see a movie of what was going to happen. I knew something terrible was going to happen to our country. I knew it was going because we were prepared. Like every way, I really advise you, please take time to be alone with God. Again, each one of us, we have where we come from, our history, our home, our own personal life. Take time private with God, just to be silent and let him talk to you. Because many times I feel like God had made me realize what was coming. I still remember thinking, oh my God, if they do what they're saying, all my tribe would be killed. And then I remember thinking, this is another funny thing. What am I going to do? Everyone is dead. How can I leave if my uncles are dead? And then I would turn to myself and say, what's wrong with you? You want to die with everybody. Is this prideful thing that I don't see others? You know, I can see others others dying and I'm the one who escapes. I want you to be myself and stop it. If it happens, you will die with them. But now I recognize it, maybe it was the voice of God that showed you that this is going to happen and they were to die. But we were prepared in some ways. And why? So in Rwanda, we had two main tribes and the people who had the power were from the Hutu tribe. So they always treated the tribes like a political parties. I mean, you know what happens in this country when it is bad around elections, you can make enemies in very, just quickly. So there was always that little tension as if we are political parties. And our parents were trying to protect us from that. So they decided to kill every one of my tribe so that they can have the power and never worry about it. So we were prepared in one way. One thing, you saw the radio, the documentary, that radio was created by the leaders of the country that was supposing the private radio. And they used to say how they're going to kill us. And the journalists would act drunk and say things like, 
No, we're going to kill them. Look at them. They're not human beings. They have horns. They have tails. I'm like, why no one is stopping this radio? They're insulting us. And like the whole country is okay with that. So you couldn't go to the police somewhere because there were the people who had the power everywhere. You didn't have a choice. Anytime I thought about it, I thought, how is it going to stop? It's like I felt something's going to blow up to be able to bring things back to normal because it was escalating. In some ways, many people ask me, do you think in America something about to happen? I truly don't believe a genocide can happen here, but what we saw happening like January or June, it can happen. And we feel like something is still continuing not to okay. However, we have God. Prayer can change all things. So we should never give up or feel like, oh, we are doomed. But I don't even know how it can happen. And we have to pray. But in the end, God has so many ways to kind of bring things back to zero, you know, to zero. So wait for prayers, can, things can change. So we had that radio and was talking and I just used to think, what is playing? What is this? Like the evil seemed to have taken over, but God has to find a way to bring this long. That was one. Another thing that prepared us is the apparitions of the Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Kibel. So Our Lady, as we know her in Fatima, she's the same lady who appeared in Lourdes in France and Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. By the world, those places. Oh, I love one lady so much. I feel like she was such a friend, and she is my our mother, all of us. That's a friend to warn you. And she really warns us around the world. If you read her messages, you will know what's going on. And there's always hope with God. So she appeared in high school before the genocide, 12 years before the genocide. And one of the messages she gave the children was that a terrible thing was going to happen to a country if we do not come back to God. If we do not come back to pray the rosary, pray from your heart. And she used to say, don't pray the rosary as Catholics. Pray it as my children. Please talk to me as your mother. I'm the mother of mankind. You know me or not. So she was speaking to all of us. She said, a terrible thing is going to happen if you don't come back to God. If you love one another, go back to the Bible, read and practice the commandments of God and respect them. If you do, what is coming is not going to happen. So I really say this with kind of pride and happy and really certainty because I just want to let you know, if we could have done what our lady said, we could actually change the genocide. It would not have happened. For some reasons, God could have changed it. So even that gives me hope today because our lady also used to say, whatever I'm sharing with you, it does not mean that only concerns Rwanda, not even just Africa, but the whole world. So the whole world is supposed to know this. And then I know that if we pray, we can actually change whatever is coming. But starting with individuals, starting with our family, starting with our countries, our rosaries actually move the people away from us and bring peace. That was something. So we knew this can happen. And then I came outside with my brother. I mean, at two minutes, all those things went through my mind. I went outside, we met my father and my mom. They were changing channels to find out what's going on in the country. I remember about two hours later, the BBC reported, BBC radio reported 18 families that were killed. And they would say things like mom and dad and, and grandma and grandpa and 10 children have just been killed in this family. And I still remember my father saying, this never happened before where they killed a whole family. Uh, that's why they call it a genocide. It was well prepared. They knew exactly what they were going to do. They knew that the president who was in power would not allow them to kill a million people under his mandate. So they had to kill him first and then blame him to kill everyone so they can eliminate the whole group. So it had just started. I remember people started to come home asking my parents what to do. My parents were teachers and they really were people who cared about the whole village. They were almost like teachers even outside. You know, the things we spoke about was a neighbor who is not going to school, or what is going on. My dad needs to go to talk to them. A family that is having trouble, my mom had to go to talk to them. It was always like they felt like they really practiced their Catholic faith, their, you know, Christian faith, just to, to really care for people. And that's what the church tells us. So with that, I think that's why people started to come home. I mean, by the second day, we had about 10,000 people who were all around the soccer field up to the door of my parents' house. I still remember parents used to bring their children for my dad to spark them for them. And it was allowed to spark children. It was not allowed here. 
<laughs> but the parents, instead of doing it, they will bring them to my mother. So I used to have a long line of children and parents. <laughs> so they were to punish them. I'm like, what is going on? What is this? But now, as a parent, I know now why they did. My, part, my father never spanked a kid out of anger. He always had to sit with you. And he would give you an appointment for when he got to spank you. <laughs> but you have first to agree that he's going to spank you for a reason. They would tell you the wrong you did, how you can be so bad, it can grow, it can ruin your life and show you all the bad things can happen if you continue that way. And then he would tell you the other side of it, how you can do the right thing, and if you change, and how these amazing things will change, and then it will happen to your family. So at the end of the case, we're like, it's okay to spank me. <laughs> and this kids became his friend. I mean, until they died, we used to have government leaders from the other tribe who would tell him, oh, too bad, we really, the government doesn't like you, doesn't like the people from the tribe. But they will still come to home to give him gifts for the lessons he gave them when they were young. So he was really loved in that way. He always was a teacher everywhere he was. Anyway, he came home, they came home and they were all around with their children asking him what to do. So I still remember the last image I saw with my father, with my whole family. He had the rosary in his hand and he was talking to people from different faith because tribes were not just Catholic. And then he talked to them, he said, and people were listening really loud and screaming. He said, if it is a matter of small group, I try to hurt us, do not be scared. Fear is our worst enemy. We will defeat them. And then he says something else that really touched my faith. However, if it is a government that planned this, I cannot lie to you, they will kill us. And I'm thinking, but you just don't tell people they're going to die. And then he says something that really touched me. Even if it was a government, let's not be scared. Let's take this as a chance God is giving us to repent our sins so that we can go to heaven. How many people who know they're going to die? I'm like, are we supposed to be happy with this? And I thought people are going to cry and scream. Actually, people listened to him and everyone was quiet, repenting. And when I saw people quiet, I started to do the same. Just in case this is my last time, let me ask God to forgive me. Because in the end, that's what we're going to report to God. What have I done with my life? And what I didn't do right, if you are lucky, if you are blessed, you actually repent now because before you meet him. So anyway, after that, my father came and gave me the rosary he had, and he asked me to go to my, to a neighbor who was from the other tribe and who was a good man. And I really again have to insist on this. Not everyone was bad in the other tribe. There's no such a people as all bad because they belong to that tribe. They belong to that country or that state. And my father used to tell us, do not judge people and put them in boxes. He always said, you will miss out many angels if you judge people and put them in boxes because you don't know who God is going to send you when you need most. And you would have judged all your angels, you know, all your people could come, come to us. So he always said, open your heart, judge people individually. If they do wrong to you, take your space, pray for them, but judge people individually. Don't put people in boxes. That was always like, okay, uh, he's teaching again. But actually, when he sent me to a man who was not the same religion, he was a Protestant pastor, and who was from the other tribe, someone who was supposed to be your enemy. But because he opened his heart, he actually knew this man, and that's why he sent me there. <clears throat> again, I left out of videos to my father. I went to this man. It was not easy to, to leave. I still remember where everyone was standing in my, you know, my mom, my dad, my brothers. It was sad. I still remember I felt as if God was telling me, look back, you will never see them again. And I, I shushed that. I, no, 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 I'm going to see them. I mean, we grew up here. But anytime I made a step, it was again, God was like, look back. I remember looking well, and to this day, anytime I miss them, I feel like, which is every day, I feel like that picture is just burned in my memory, in my mind, where everyone was. So I went to the neighbor and he put me to sit in this tiny bathroom, three by four feet. And I remember looking at that bathroom, I'm like, this is too small for me. What am I going to do? Where do I sleep? What do I eat? Well, as I was complaining, he went back and brought five more women. Later, he brought two more women. We were eight people in three by four feet. And when I saw that, I learned another big lesson. 
When you think things are bad, they can get worse. <laughs> Not to scare you, or you should be scared of what can happen. Just really, the lesson was complaining doesn't help. Whatever you have, try to work with what you have, but complaining does not help. Actually, I realized that when we complain and blaming, we miss a chance to do something about the situation because we're too busy thinking about who is doing wrong. But we need to care for ourselves now, in the moment, and then we become angry at people. So he put us there. He told us that he won't tell his children that we were there. He told us not to make any noise. We didn't know each other. That didn't matter really. All you need to know is a person like you. We cry for the same reasons. We laugh for the same reasons. So we just need to care for one another. We sat there. I remember the first week I was so angry. That's when I started to be, develop all these bad, bad emotions. I was so angry. I just wanted to fly planes and, and throw grenades and bombs all over the country. And in my mind, I felt like I did it. In my mind, I was sweating, I'm breathing hard out of these poisonous thoughts. And really, that scared me. And then I would be impatient. And from impatience, I would move to fear. And all those emotions, they hurt you differently, differently. And then I remember thinking, what am I going to do? I can't even talk. So at the end of that week, he, he was bringing us food, and he would bring food at night, and he would bring just a little plate, the food they took from the garbage, and give us one so that we don't die, really. So at the end of the week, when he came to give us food, I remember I grabbed his food and I asked him if he can put the radio outside so we can hear what's going on in the country. He was kind, he put three different radios, different channels. I couldn't believe what was going on in the country. They were giving prices to people who killed more people, the government. They were not anymore hiding behind the private radio, they were now out. Government ministers calling people, don't forget children, don't forget elder people. It was just completely evil. They were calling people, kill everyone of that tribe. And after that, we are going to live in paradise. We are never going to leave those people. So now this is good. And then it was for us. They gave order to start searching every home. You think it was bad to be sitting in one place, but to think that somebody is going to come to work for you it was the worst thing I've known. It didn't take long. I remember I was stretching and I saw through this tiny window of the bathroom, something I thought was a thousand people, but they were later by quarters, they were three to 400. So people from my village, people I can call friends, I went to school with. They came inside, they were dressed in banana leaves, they had all kinds of arms, machetes, and they started to search everywhere. The only reasonable thing that was going through my mind was, my life is over. They found us. I mean, this was a four-bedroom house. There are so many. You can't fight. You can't do anything. That's it. It's over. I started to ask myself, how do you die? How is my soul going to come out? Who am I going to see? Am I going to see Jesus? Am I going to see Mary? And I was apologizing to God again, anything I could have done. But in that moment, I felt like I wasn't sure anymore if God was there. Because there's a time when in life you are going to be tempted and everything you know, you start to question, is it sure? Did I even ask any question? I remember in that moment of pain and agony, I mean, waiting for the people to reach the door, it was like a thousand needles were going through my body. Like I'm in fire, but I'm not dying. I wish to die and be done with it. But I have to wait until they find me. Then I remember feeling as if there were like two voices. And these contrary voices, opposing voices, nothing too strange. You know, the things you go through when you're facing a challenge, have to make a decision. One voice was telling me, open the door, end the torture. Why wait? They're going to find you anyway. Die like a man, get, just get out and look at them. They will kill you anyway. And I felt like that is more reasonable. Why wait? Let me just end it. I cannot go through this a second time. However, I feel like there was another voice that was contrary to this. Do not open the door. Ask God to help you. Do you know who God is? God is almighty. Do you know what almighty means? It means he can do anything. Do you know what anything means? It means even if they open the door, they might not see you. Isn't it what God tells us for those who believe in him, that all things are possible? What that leaves it out, nothing. Even if they shoot you, the bullet might not go through you. 
So if God wants, so you have interest in keeping praying and holding to hope. Whatever you want, tell God. Because I know many people were praying to die. And some didn't, others did. Like, just God, take me, take me. I was not ready. My like, God, no, I know I'm going to die, but I don't like that. I don't want to die like this. I don't want to die in this turmoil, no peace. And then I remember I had to choose a voice to listen to. Because being confused is the worst thing. We really have to ask God today, do I truly believe in him? And then hurry, do what he says to do. And I remember how to choose a voice. And I remember turning to the nicer voice. And I asked God with every cell of my body, I asked God, if there is anyone who created me, if there is anyone who put all this together, the moon, the stars, the sun, all this earth I'm standing, I'm sitting on, if there's anyone who controls my breath, I am begging you, just give me one sign that you are there so that I can continue to talk to you. Because right now, I'm not even sure. I mean, I ask myself, why are innocent people dying? Is God there? It was a moment, a huge temptation. And I asked him, just give me a sign. And I wanted a specific sign because I didn't want it to be luck. Many times when we call luck, we kind of go back to luck and like, hey, luck, help me again. You know, but if it's God who did it, you can go to him and like, okay, I'm in trouble again. Please help me. I wanted to be sure that there's a God who heard me and my voice from inside. I remember ask God, if you can hear me, I don't want to see them in the face. I don't want them to shoot me and the bullet will not kill me. I just want them not to open the door of this bathroom. I don't want to look in their face. And I know you can do all the things. So please, if you are there, hear me and give me the sign that you are listening. After I say that, I didn't hear anything. It was like I fainted and I didn't hear anything. Until five hours later, the man came to see us. We were still like this. At least I can speak for myself. I wasn't caring much about looking at others. I was still like this. And I thought they were still there. And then he told us what happened. He said, they have left five hours before. And he told us what happened. There were three to 400 people, people from our village. He was shocked to see many people, Christians. He was a protest, protestant pastor. Some of them Catholic, some of them Protestant, some of them from every religion. They were in that group. So they came and a big number went around the house to make sure no one jumps out of the window. And another number went inside the house to make sure that no one is hiding. They searched everywhere, under the beds, in the closets. They went under the beds. They went in every room. They went in the roof of the house with flashlights to make sure they took a ladder, went in the, in the roof, in the ceiling, to make sure no one was hiding there. They went on the roof of the house on top to make sure no one was laying there. And that is places where they found people every day. And he told us at last, the only place we have not searched was that bathroom one of the killers came and touched the handle. He told us, I was sweating, I was shaking. They could have known. He looked at my face, they would have known. Touched the handle before he pulled, he looked at the man, he said, you know what, we trust you. You are a good man, there's no one here. And they turned around and left. So when he told us that, I remember he said, I don't know how you are praying, what you are doing, but whatever you are doing, keep doing it. <laughs> I don't understand why they stopped at the place where you are, not in the ceiling, not in, on the roof, not in the closet. They opened suitcases to make sure there were no babies hiding. So they searched everywhere and they stopped right there. So to me, what I got was, God heard me. God heard my prayer. And I started to completely a new day, a new page in my life. And I started to think, Oh, so what our priests have been telling us is really true. God can hear you in your heart. You don't even have to say anything. But that is really good because you realize that we are never alone. You can be talking to angels. You can be talking to God inside. You are never alone, even when you are alone. You are never lonely. And then that was good, but there was another bad news. That means that if this is it, then that means he can see everything we are thinking about. That means we have no privacy. It was a little bit scary. You mean like, you know my anger? You know, like, even if I'm praying to you, actually, I'm trying to kill people if I had a chance to. I was ashamed of that. And I started to talk to God just as I'm talking to you now. I would tell him, well, I know you don't like my anger, but, you know, they try to kill us. So I hope you don't mind, you know, because they're really bad. They're not normal people. They're evil. Send them to hell. And I felt like God was fine with me. 
And then I asked the pastor to give me the Bible. I had the rosary my father have given me. I mean, if you believe God is real, what do you do? It's not just about believing. You start to do his will. You know, if you believe in this school and you want to go to school, you come here and you start studying. You're just like, oh, good, you know, I want to go to school, right? There's a school there. You have to do the work. And if you want to be a part of the school, you have to do the all work. So if you believe God is there and he concerns your life that much, he's the one who made you. He's the one who gives you guidance on how to live. What do you do? You want to pray unceasingly and read it to understand. So I remember reading the Bible from Genesis, not that I read everything, I don't think so, in the whole Bible, but I felt like I wanted to know at least the whole picture from what I knew. I've had a few questions with God. Why did you create me? There's a mess here. I don't want to be part of it. If I had the choice, I wouldn't have been wanted to be born here. And I felt like God was speaking back to me. I created you because I wanted to share with you the good I have, like good parents. We have children because we want to give them love, to love them and to give them all we have, we have work for. So the same, God wants to give us not only what is here on earth, but more importantly, for eternity, he created us to be happy forever and ever. I'm like, oh, that's good. But um, then how long am I supposed to be here? I mean, how long does a human being live? Maybe a hundred years, how many people will reach to that? Okay, I just wanted to know the whole picture. So where do we go after that? There's a choice of heaven and there's a choice of hell. It's up to you what you work for. It's really hard to work for a price if you don't know what the price is about. So I wanted to know about heaven to make sure that it is worth working for. I went to the Bible, which I will give you, please, I give you advice, just read about by the heaven. I read a lot about people who have died and came back, or some visionaries, like those in the Kibeho. Our lady one day, for example, one of them, she told them, I'm going to take you for two days. Tell them not to bury you. And she fell down and died. And two days later, she woke up. So, and she said, oh, yes, and she, they, were, they tested them and to make sure that this was a person gone. And it was on appointment. She gave them the hour she was going to take them, to take her. And then other person, different th th days. And then two days later, she came back. And our lady told her, go and tell people what you have seen. Tell them that this is real. So she saw hell. She saw a place we call it purgatory, but our lady told her is a place of purification where things are purified, and then showed her heaven, which was so beautiful. And then she told our lady, Well, you know, usually you ask, Mother, can I please this time when she saw heaven? She didn't ask our lady. She said, I'm not leaving. I am saying. So she didn't ask. She just wanted to make a statement. I'm saying, I'm not leaving. And our lady said, no, you came here just for a visit. You have to go back and tell people what you came to see. So these things are real. But I remember in, 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 during that genocide, reading a lot about heaven, and I started to see things again. I hold in my church, I'm Catholic, and what they told us about heaven, heaven is a paradise. The roads are diamond and gold. There's no more pain. There's no heat. There's no cold. There's no wind. But it's just like nice. There's wind, maybe just beautiful. And it's just like so good. There's no more ever getting older. There's no more getting tired. There's nothing aching. The more I saw that, I'm like, who doesn't want to go there? This is really good. I didn't want to even contemplate hell. It's hell. You don't want to go there. I mean, I felt I was living in hell. And then I wanted to know from the Bible, how do you get to heaven? This place, if I miss it, this is not worth living. I need to make sure that I can live a life that can, in the end, put me to a nice place. I read in the Bible, I remember looking at the commandments of God and thinking, this is good. This is not so bad. I can do this. I can go there. Until I started to read more in the Bible. And some pages, some words actually, it felt as if they were floating on the pages of the Bible. Every page I opened was about forgiveness. The very thing that was so hard on me. So I would open the page and it would say, uh, pray for your enemies. Uh, no, no, close that page. Let me see another page. The commandments, man, not this. I mean, all the commandments, you can't love God without respecting him, everything he wants. So I would open another page. Pray for those who hate you, who persecute you. I'm like, no, 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 close that page. Anything else, anything else. And I would open another page. Forgive, how many times? Seven, 70 times. Oh my gosh, now I thought I am going to miss out the nice place. 
And I really got scared. I said, okay, let me just not read the Bible because it's asking me too many things that I don't want to see. And I started to say the rosary my father have given me. And as you know, many of you know about the rosary. You don't run away from the Bible to the rosary because the rosary is the summary of the Bible. You know, the life of Christ from the beginning, he came and, and really the New Testament and the Old because he's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. So you go through his life, the joy, and his mother by his side, what happened, and the sorrow, and then the glory when he resurrected, when he defeated the evil, and he was resurrected. So it's really all about the Bible. So when I said, however, my first rosary, I am not kidding. It felt like I moved from a place of hell to a place of air. And that what our lady have taught us, pray the rosary for peace. She always said, even when you don't know what is taking away your peace, you feel just like not happy inside, there is stress, you don't know where it's coming from. Our lady always said, find a quiet place, say the rosary, meditate on it. She said, I promise you, your peace will be back. Will be back. So again, you hear that when you have, you know, you live in a peace relatively as a person in your heart, you don't know what that feels like, how much that meant to, to us until you don't have any peace. I felt so peaceful. And then I said, let me say another rosary. It feels really good. I said another one and another one. I ended up praying all day from morning until night. So there is this part of the rosary that started to give me troubles. Our Lord is prayer, our common prayer. Again, that is in the Bible. Our Lord gave us is a part of the rosary. In one rosary, you say, I think uh, six, our Lord is praying. So anytime I've reached to this part, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Oh, I couldn't say that. No, 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 I can't say that because I don't mean it. But if I don't, then I'm not respecting God. And I have told him I truly believe in him. So what am I going to do? Anytime I reached that part, it was like a red flag. Oh, I'm lying to God. And if you lie to friends, you, you risk to lose them. How can I say, God, I want you when I want you, but I will lie to you or not tell, do what you want. It wasn't a good relationship. And I want God to be my true friends. So I was stuck. I didn't know how to go through that part and say it because it was disturbing my whole peace inside. You need to say things I don't mean. Well, one day I got, I thought I got it. I had an idea. I thought, let me skip this part of the prayer. And then I don't have to lie to God. So I, st I start to skip that part. And let me tell you, I felt so much better. I wasn't lying to him anymore. So I said, good, I will go to that part. I go to the next part. God, I'm sorry, I don't want to lie to you. <laughs> I keep going like that until one day. You know, one thing our lady used to tell us in Quebec, she used to say, pray with sincerity, pray without hypocrisy. I never knew how important that is. That means even if you don't mean it, even if you have to change your prayer, at least be sincere to God. At least admit I can't say that than lying to him or pretending. Because I realize that when you start that journey, God now can actually change your heart. He can give you a new understanding. So I was praying that way until one day I remember, remember to skip the part. I felt as if something was touching me and reminding me, like, hey, I hope you know our Lord's prayer is not man-made. It's Jesus himself who gave those words. The one you believe is God. The one you believe cannot make a mistake, who knows the past and the future. If I were you, I wouldn't try to edit his prayer. But I go, what am I going to do now? Because I need him. Oh, sometimes it's so much better not to know too much. You know, I really felt I got it until now. What am I going to do? For the first time in my life, I understood the meaning of surrendering. I went on my knees and I put my hands up and I told God, if you know how to forgive, help me out because I don't. If you say those words, you are God, I am not. I make a mistake, you never make mistakes. So if you say so, it must be so, it must be true. What do you tell him? I gave it to him and I realized that what I was lacking in that moment was a humility to put in his hands. We don't have to know how to figure out everything. All we ask God wonders from us, pray and what you can't, give it to me. We are not God, just ask him to help. Ask him, tell him your needs. 
And he's going to work on it as long as you continue to have that relationship that is, you know, built and fade through prayer. So I gave it to him. Every time I reached that part, I would remind God, I still don't know how to forgive. But this time, I give it to you. It is in your hand. Help me out. Be careful of what you pray for. I remember one time I was meditating on a part of the rosary when the sorrowful mysteries, when we think about our Lord dying on the cross. So I watched him. I didn't want to see it like a crosses where you don't see blood. He's there. I mean, he has nails in his body. Pinch yourself. See how that feels. It's painful. His body is pulling down. And to make it worse, his mother is standing beneath. This was a mother like all of us, except that she was purer. And that means she can love more purer. And those who love most, they suffer most. You can lose somebody, your friends will be sorry for you, will cry for you, but nobody's going to feel it as you do because you love that person. And Mary loved more than we can ever love. So you can only imagine the pain she was going through. The more I saw them, I'm like, okay, I'm fine. My pain was like becoming less. The more I thought about their pain, mine was like, I'm fine, I'm still here, but you are going to die. And the people were killing you, they're mocking you, they're laughing, and you are so much in the pain watching your mother and your mother watching you. This was so sad. And the more I watched him, I remember asking Jesus, why did you have to go through this? I know you are God, you can hear me. I know you wanted to save us, but why this way? You know, you could come like a rich man and just still be comfortable and still save us, you know, and be okay because he's God, he can do all things. Why did he take this way? The poor way, the hurtful way, the miserable, the rejected one. Why? He took our place. Why? I feel like Jesus was speaking back. I went through this because I love you. I went through this to show you that if you are ever in my position, if you ever are rejected, not well loved, if you are ever told you are not good enough, I mean, we all get discriminated in some ways. Some people you are too tall, sometimes you are too short. Sometimes you're too big, you're too small, you're too light, you're too big. It's just always like, there's always something the world, people, family can discriminate with. with. I feel like exactly our Lord was taking me there. I went through this so that I can show you, not by words, by action. If you ever go through that, learn from me. How did I behave in my own problems? How did I behave in my own ordeal? Did I want to kill people as you're trying to do? Did I even say one bad word? I suffered. He cried. He was in such a pain. His mother was crying. And not once they seen they did anything wrong. But wow, this is, I mean, I accepted them. When we believe, we have to believe fully. I accept them. This is really something. But why? I kept reading the words he said on the cross. And I remember one that took me by shock, by surprise. When he said his last words, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. It wasn't the first part. Forgive them. By this time, I wanted to forgive. But the second part, they don't get it. I felt as if our Lord was speaking to my heart. People who are trying to kill you, they don't even measure the consequences that will come to their, heart, their life. And you trying to be like them only add up to the number of madness. Learn from me. Whatever pain you have, give it to me. Whatever sin you want to confess, talk to me, I will forgive you. Uh, what do you need? Talk to me. I literally saw that, I'm like, that's it. You're right. How can somebody kill a child and know what they're doing? They don't know what they do. And in that moment, I also realized that I don't know what I was doing in my anger. When I feel like I'm going to be a soldier just to kill people, I don't know what I was doing. I was one of those killers. I needed to forgive myself too. It was as if all of a sudden, the world was divided in two parts, a part of love and a part of hate. And I felt as if God was telling me, you see, we all belong to somewhere on those two parts, love or hate, or we jump between the two. I'm loving now, I'm hating now. But the people who are the hero, who remain on the side of love, are the people like we know, Mother Teresa, the saints, People we know in the history of peace, like Mandela, a man who went to prison for 27 years, and he comes out and he said, let's talk about reconciliation. Like, what? These are the people. And on the side of hate, when people like Hitler, 
people like those who were killing us during the genocide. Me, who was hoping, thinking about killing, and I felt like our Lord was asking me, where do you want to be? Who do you admire? You want to be on the side of these people, Mother Teresa, or this side? And of course, I'm like, oh, no, no, I like these people. This is where I want to be. And I felt like literally, physically, I moved. And what I realized was, the people on the side of love, who remain loving and peaceful, are people who have known hatred, who have been hated. But no matter what happened to them, they remain loving. These people have known injustice, but no matter what injustice that have been done, always they have had is life. They don't have anything bad happen to them. That's why they're not in my shoes to know what I'm going through. When I saw that, it was understanding that changed completely my life in that second. It was as if a huge luggage was lifted from my shoulders and I was free. I knew where I'm going to be. I'm going to belong. I knew where I will stand for the rest of my life. What is wrong will be done? No, I will speak and I will teach them about love. And I believed in that moment people can change. Because if I can change, why not another person? So that really put me back to the Bible where the Bible tells us, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. Because if you believe in God, you believe in the power of prayer, you know people can change. And the more you pray for them, for them to change, not just to have it like, oh, go and continue to do bad, have a good life. Change your heart. Pray for those who hate you, who do bad to you, because then they will change not because of them, because of God and through your prayer. That's when I understood the meaning of that. And I felt free and luggage was lifted and I, my life was much better. If you, you've learned, you, know, you read my book, Left to Tell, I started to learn English when I was sitting in the bathroom because when these hateful things are gone, when you really start to follow God, it is as if a veil is unveiled, you can almost look in the future. I was so sure I am going to be talking English. I was so sure I'm going to work with people who speak English. And the funniest thing, three months later, I found myself in Office of United Nations being interviewed in English. And I remember every word I knew in English was what I learned in the bathroom. And what I learned was imagining somebody asking me questions. What's your name? Where do you come from? What did you study? What is your parents? Tell me your story. And of course, I wasn't any perfect. I thought I'm still not perfect. But at least I was able to explain what I started, what I want to do, what I wish to do, what I wish. And every question they asked me, it felt like I memorized it in the bathroom. I remember when they were interviewing me, they said, I feel like I've been in this room before. And of course, I have rehearsed when I was in the bathroom. And this interview, and actually I passed, and I started my very first draw was with United Nations in Rwanda which led me to come to this country. And when I got, when I got married and we came here, and from there, that's when I was able to write a book. And now here I am, every single week, I'm speaking somewhere in English, dealing with people in English. <laughs> so it is really something just like, again, God speak to us. Anyway, we ended up staying in that bathroom three months. We went in in April, we came out in July. The very first night I came out, I found out everyone in my family was killed. I found that my mom was killed, my dad, my two brothers, my grandma, my grandpa, my friends, my best friends, my neighbors, my schoolmates, a million people was killed in a period of three months. Rwanda is the size of Maryland state. Somebody told me the size of Massachusetts. It's a small country. To have a million dead, dead bodies were everywhere. And I remember crying when I heard the news and I threw the rosary on the side. It is the only thing I had uh, for only a few minutes because I just felt like prayer was almost too good to be true. It, it, it sheltered me, it shielded me. And I was scared that one day I'm going to break down. This prayer is just like almost like somebody just distracting me. I realized now it was what was giving me strength. I'm like, forget about this. I just need to cry like everybody. I need to, this is crazy. How can I leave? Our homes were destroyed. Any picture that didn't remind you who you were, it was all destroyed and burned. And after like five minutes of crying, I felt like there was like a giant hand of God, something that was telling me, don't cry, don't die. I am with you. 
more than anyone you know, the journey of your loved ones is over here and not in heaven. And heaven is much better and much longer. But your journey is still here and you don't know how long it's going to be. It might be one more day. And the truth is no one among us have any guarantee to live one more day. We really take it for granted, but we don't know. It might be one year, 10, 20, 50, 60, but whatever that is, only God knows. So what is in your capacity? I felt the voice was telling me. What is in your power is how you choose to use the moment of today now. Now, you can choose to love or to choose hate. It's up to you. Then you choose heaven or you choose hell. You can choose to be kind or be mean. Then you choose hell. You can choose to use your life to do something constructive, uplift another person, or you can be destructive. But if you choose love, if you choose me, I am with you. I will give you whatever you need. And you don't need to ask for too much. If you are still alive tomorrow, I'm still there too. You can ask me what you need tomorrow. We really don't have to be greedy. We don't have to grab everything. Tomorrow it becomes, then God is there. I literally woke up from my tears and I started to look around in the refugee camp. Anyone I can give help because I don't know what my life is, when it's going to end. And it wasn't easy to, to love somebody because the job, the goal was to love, to care. You know, there were children who didn't, you know, who had wounds. There were people who were talking nonstop because they have beat them in the head. They have lost their mind. There were refugees sleeping outside. And I thought, what can I do to be good then? I felt that a voice was suggesting to me. You can write a list of the people here. At least you can help the soldiers who are protecting you to know who is who and what situation they're in. You can go to speak to that kid who is lonely and crying. Just find the heart they feel. You don't have to have much to give. As long as you give your heart, you give your love, you give your attention. And I'm not kidding, that's what I did every day. Every morning I woke up, okay, God, pray, and then go around asking, how are you? How are you feeling? Anything you wish me to do with what we have? And then they would give, give us crackers and cheese. I mean, the canned food, because the soldiers were not prepared for that. And give us milk mixed with bad water. That's how we ate. And at the end of the day, I would take my rosary, look to the sky, and I would ask God, if you choose to take me today, I hope I have loved somebody. Because when we die, we are going to give an account of what we have done, the work we have done, the love we have loved. When my brother died right after his master's degree, I can't say that his life was cut short, knowing what I know now. That time I felt like, oh, you know, he didn't even get the chance to work. But you know what? God judged him from the time he spent in school. The effort he put in his work with love, the care he cared about his friends, that all that was meant for him. How he became a good son, helping dad and mom, you know, thanking them for the good they do for him. That's what he had to do. And actually he was a very good man. One of the sweet examples I remember of my brother, one time there was a friend of his, the same age, young, you know, teenagers playing soccer outside. And then the friend was really poor, have not even been able to go to school. And his whole clothes were just teared up. So my brother came to me and said, I wish to give him my t-shirt, but I don't want to, to talk to him like he's below me. So I, I have to find a way to give it to him and keep his dignity. And I really admired my brother in his ways. I would never tell him that, but in my heart, <laughs> oh no, we had to fight with brother and sister. Never tell him anything about, oh, I want to buy you. But in my heart, I'm like, why is he like that? Why can't I think about good things like him? Why can't I treat people like my brother does? He just was loved by everybody, has a way. So he told me, I need to know how I can give it to him without hurting his ego. I'm like, well, you know, you will think about that. But when I'm in my room, I'm like, what? He had to think about that? Like, do I think about people's pride when I do something good? He really just admired his ways. So this is what he did. He came to me after he goes like, I got it. I know what it, this is I'm saying for those who read about him. I'm going to ask him to play soccer with me and I will let him beat me and I will beg him if he beat me, I can give him my clothes. And then he will know that he got the clothes because he beat me. I was crying alone. Again, never told him like, oh, that was so good. We're just like, how? 
how does he think about this? And actually he did. I went to watch because it was touching my heart. I went to watch and he forward and this, and the boy beat him and he gave him his clothes just to protect his dignity. Do we do that? So he was really, when I think about it today, I'm like, your time was up to go to heaven, to be rewarded. Because before you can do sins of hurting people, do, before the world can change you. And I think that God took him. So anyway, after that, uh, in refugee camp, one of the things I really love and I really want to suggest to you, especially as young, many young people here, please trust God with your requests, with your intentions. I used to write to God because I knew he was my only parent I had. I would write to him like number one up to maybe 150. So I tell him like, I need clothes to change and I need a bed. And I will not assume that the bed will come with blankets. So I will tell him I need blankets too. <laughs> and I need, I need bed sheets and I need also a pillow. <laughs> And I need the shoes, I need a comb for my hair, I need cream for my body, I need every little thing I would ask him, just not take things for granted. And then I'm not kidding, how one by one it came through, it was something to, to just like really teach you how to trust in God. So one of the things, for example, a friend of mine, we were still writing to each other yesterday, she still lives in Belgium. So she went from my school, she had got a scholarship to go to Belgium. So she sent me an envelope. And she went to the airport to find anybody who's going to Rwanda. Only military were going to Rwanda, not anyone during that time. And then she told the person, look for somebody, this is a name around the same age group, give it to anyone, they will find her, because she didn't know where it was. <laughs> so in the envelope, she put a jeans and a t-shirt and a dress. And she put a note and she said, I have got many people who died in our class, but no one have ever confirmed to me that you, were dead, you are dead. In case you are still alive, you must need some clothes because I know what happened. That envelope reached my refugee camp. When I opened that, I went to the letter, I wrote to God, I need clothes to change. I'm like, okay, good, you send them. Can you believe that God will find a way without an address? Somebody from Belgium sending that because God uses people. And it was really like that when I came in the USA, you know, when I wrote my first book, Left to Tell, I remember I started to worry, to think, I don't speak English well. I want to write a book. I want to just help somebody who is crying and going through something. But how can I write? I thought, oh, people are born writers. So let me not even think about that. <coughs> somebody would always remind me, please write a book. We want to see it written. Please write a book. One time I decided to write, it was like an obsession. The first draft took me three weeks. The second draft, oh, now it's boring, it's not anymore like that, you won't write so much. It took me three months, went through correcting this and that, three months. But during those three months, so many times, some people, or even myself, that bad voice would come back like, no boy is going to publish your book. You're losing time, just don't worry. I'm like, you're right. It sounds like me being reasonable. I don't even know, but no English. I would put it down. When I go to say my rosary, which I do every day, the nicer voice will come back and say, please go back to your book. Finish your part. Do as you did that time in the genocide. Ask God to help you. I mean, is he going to fix my English? Is he going to fix, who is he going to bring? But just do your part and finish and keep praying. So I started to fast. I would go to mass every day. I started to go to confession every week because you have to cleanse here. If you want to be in good terms with God, asking him, you have to make sure too that you are not offending him. So this relationship is clean. I got a confession and then I really had strength to keep writing. So I still remember this. I finished the book, never met any author in my life. I finished the book March 31st, 2005. Three days after, I remember just laughing with God, you know, in your heart. And I put the, all the papers in the envelope, khaki envelope, and I put the pen there and I told God, I'm done, my part is over. So now let me see your part because I have done my part. I don't know what else to do. I mean, I remember thinking, do you just knock a door? Where is the publisher? What do you do? It just was completely confusing. And three days after, I'm not kidding, a friend of mine from Rwanda gave me a free ticket. Somebody gave her to go to a conference and it'll be like this. But there were many speakers and many, many people in that conference. And I remember the ticket was $245. So somebody gave her a free ticket to give to somebody. So she gave it to me and I went to the, this conference. It was really good. They were talking about being fearless, not necessarily in a godly way, 
but being fearless to trusting yourself, which is sometimes not so good, you know. With God, we trust like we are good, we are okay, you know, but that is what is sustainable to me. So anyway, at the end of the conference, I remember coming out. This is how God works. Please hold on to him. I see a man standing in a corner and there's a long line of people going to him. And everyone is going to him excited. I see people leaving him. Some of them are crying and happy laughing. And I told myself, what is he telling people? Something said, well, join the line and see what he's telling people. So I joined the line randomly just to see what's going on because I can see everyone else was joining. When I reach about 30 people, I realize that everybody had a book. They were going for the man to autograph his book he wrote. Then I thought, my goodness, I don't know what he writes about, who he is. What am I going to tell him that I came there? So something was like, just go buy a book, be like everybody, and then give it to him. Pretend like you know what you're doing. <laughs> so I went and bought his book and put it to him. This time I felt accomplished. I just want to run. And he put me back. He said, how are you? I said, I'm fine. And then he said, where that accent comes from? I didn't know I had an accent. But I told him I'm from Rwanda and his, la his eyes lit up. And he said, oh, do you know what happened in Rwanda? You're asking me. <laughs> I said, I know, but everything is good now. He said, oh, where is your parents? Oh, he was good. He wanted to get the news quickly. Where is your siblings? Were you there? So I had to tell him the truth. I'm like, well, they're in heaven. I'm here. I was there. Everything is good now. Just quick. And he goes like, so how did you escape? How did you? Again, in one minute, I just told him I went. I was in the bathroom for three months. And uh, God saved my life. He looked at me again. He said, you lost your parents. You were hiding this long. And you are still smiling? What makes you smile? I told him, well, there's God. It doesn't end here. I just hope I can work for heaven too and go there. And then he looked at me and was like, have you thought about writing a book? <laughs> I couldn't tell him like, yeah, I finished three days ago. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you would think I'm like a psychic or something. You know, I plan to come there. So I thought, I thought about that. Actually, I started. And before I finished, he said, I promise you, if you can find a way to write how you can be yourself and tell what happened, I'm sure there is a secret. And I knew what the secret was. I'm sure there's a secret. And I promise you, I'll publish your book. I'm like, who are you? How do you know? I mean, how? Three days before, I literally told God, I'm done. Tell me what to do now. And he's now bringing somebody three days after I never met in my life. So long story short, we exchanged email with this man, his daughter, who was my age. Yeah, he told me actually he's a writer, but he doesn't use a computer. He only writes by hand. And then he gave it to people to type it. So anyway, his daughter, we exchanged numbers. And a week later, he called me and he asked me, what is taking you too, so long? Why are you not sending me the, the book? I was thinking, oh, that bad voice. Don't listen to him. The bad voice was telling me, oh, he forgot you. Don't even send it to him. Do you see how he's nice to everybody? How can you remember you after he met a thousand people? And I believed it. I'm like, ah, oh, let me wait. Maybe he forgot me. He's just a nice person who asks everybody, you know, to do this. The bad voice again convinced me to let it. Just do your part. The hardest thing is to do what you're supposed to do and not think for other people and not think for God. What is going on? So I went home and he called me like a week later and I told him, well, you know, I didn't think you remember me. He's like, send me the book now. Again, long story short, this man introduced me to his editor, to his publisher, and the book was published out eight months later. I still remember. My publisher, who is not a necessary Catholic publisher, they published the book on March 1st, 2006, which was Ash Wednesday. And this is funny, I fasted for six months so that I wasn't eating meat, not even fish. I was completely vegetarian, praying that this book would be good. For six months later, I'm about to break my fast. I have a party, literally on the day the book was out. And then I go to church, our priest says, it's going to be next Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. Oh, I had to stop my party. I had to remember I'm a Catholic. And I added another 40 days to my six months of fasting before I can have a party. And really a miracle happened. The book came out and within the late two weeks after, the book was a New York Times bestseller. I didn't even know what I meant, because it was so new. And everyone was congratulating me. I'm like, what do you mean? What happened? Is it because I live in New York? What is it? Why? What is a new Times bestseller? It was really a book that completely changed a lot. 
And I'm so grateful to be able to share with you. But behind everything is just to share with you the power of God and the responsibility each one of us have just today to be the best we can. Forgive who you can today because you just don't know about tomorrow. And enjoy and be happy, but make sure that you know that at the end, we are going to give an account of what we have done. And lastly, I want to say this, you know, anytime I speak to a group, I'm aware that I'm speaking to everyone in the group, but truly, we are individuals. Each one of us have history. I mean, some of you, I can tell we come from different countries, different background. We all have our pain, we all have our obstacles. We have all have our, our challenges. And I just want to say from my heart to yours, please remember, there is always hope with God. Hold on to your prayer. And especially, I advise you, hold on to the rosary. Our Lady, really, if you can say it, again, it's really the Bible. I have my Protestant friends who say the rosary because I have taken time to pray with them and they have experienced miracles. Our Lady said, pray the rosary for this intention. I promise you shall obtain what you pray for. Our job is just to pray. So please hold on to God and remember there's always hope, no matter how bad the situation is. Our Lady Nikibeho, she taught us another rosary called Seven Soros Rosary. For those who can, please learn about that. Actually, I think my daughter has some of them in the a, in a next building where I get from Rwanda so that I can continue also to help my foundation because I have a foundation where I help kids in Rwanda to go to college, to go to high schools. Many poor people don't even have $300 to be able to pay for scholarship, scholarship. I mean, for school fees for a year, $300 for a year. So if anyone gets that, please pray the seven souls rosary. Our lady have given many promises to hear us and to change hearts and to heal our hearts. And she said the most total of impossible cases, prayers will be resolved when we meditate in her tears. And lastly, I want to say, if I can forgive, anyone can forgive. They have to go there. There is so much peace. And I hope and I pray that one day you will come to Rwanda. Rwanda is now really beautiful and very peaceful. Actually, my friends here, we have been together, Marsha and Nelson, we have been together in Rwanda. They know what it is and continue to grow because people have learned from the hard way, because people have gone through suffering. No one wants to play. We don't have any more tribes. If you know your tribe, you know it, but you don't write it anywhere because they realize that people can hold each other by just continue to write down who you are, which tribe. The government have removed it. The government now is really good and people are happy. If you can, I go to Rwanda twice a year. I take people to visit to, on a pilgrimages to a lady and also the country. If you can, you can please join me. My next one is November 23rd. So it's not too late. You can join us. <laughs> if not, may you see or the year after. If God give us life to continue to live. Anyway, may the Lord bless you. Please pray for me and I pray for you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being with us. Um, before we're going to offer glory be right before uh, we all leave, but um, you'll be across the, the way to uh, uh, greet people and sign books. Uh, thank you so much. And let us give glory to God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Kobea, pray for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to offer to you uh, as a token, just a token of our appreciation, uh, this pen. As a writer, I know you both are pens. Thank you all for being here today. We're going to let Immaculate go over to the main academic building where she will be signing books. She has a table set up right near the beach there if you'd like to have your uh, common reading signed. There's also a merchandise table, and Immaculate's daughter is there as well, and has um, several pieces there. Again, it's just support um, her mission. Again, uh, a thank you to Aaron and Rachel and the Common Reef Committee for.